we want to welcome the visitors that are here today. We have many visitors actually here today, it looks like, yeah. and we're we're excited. Excited to have you worshiping here with us today, and I hope you receive a blessing from, from what you've heard so far, and I hope that you will receive a blessing from what the um, Holy Spirit will uh, will have you here uh, here shortly. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to uh, say a word of prayer and uh, ask the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you in the words that are spoken. Sorry, I took your sins. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come humbly before you today to ask for your Spirit to be here. Not only in the spoken word, Lord, but also in the hearts of those listening. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will just guide and direct each one of us as this world is coming to a, uh, an obvious close, Lord. Um, it is just more important that we search our hearts and ask for your leading in how we can uh, help share the gospel message to this hurting world. Please come quickly and take us home with you, Lord. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My message today is called A Call to Action. It was August 15, 1944. I will always remember the stars that night as we rocked back and forth aboard our infantry ship, the LC-45. 20 miles off the Mediterranean shore, it was our last glimpse of the beauty of God's creation before the horrifying hours to come. In a few hours, Operation Dragoon would begin, and we would advance towards the fortified beaches of St. Tropez in South France. With anticipation building, I was thinking about my young wife and my new son, or sorry, my new daughter, whom I have never met. As the boat swayed, it seemed like more than miles separated us. It seemed like a lifetime. It had been two years since I had followed my conscience conscience and signed up to do my part and serve my country. As it turned out, I landed the role of chaplain. In moments like this, in the somber quiet, before the chaos of war, the deeper questions about life, the ones we keep locked under lock and key, rise to the surface unbidden. That's where I come in, a hand on the shoulder and a quiet prayer. A verse of scripture to strengthen the faint heart. A listening ear to help a man clear his conscience, knowing he might be his maker today. A reminder amidst the ugliness that a God of beauty and wonder still exists. Bob Evans enrolled to serve his country voluntarily. In that act, he enrolled to be, a, to be of service to individual men and to fulfill Jesus' call to preach the gospel to all the world. As chaplain in the army, he was to remain on the large ship while the soldiers were transported to the front lines to do the fighting, thus keeping him out of any direct combat situations. He would not have it. Bob requested to serve alongside his fellow soldiers in battle, no matter the consequence. He cared enough for their eternal salvation, that he could not stay back in safety while others were put in harm's way. He was called by God to minister to his fellow soldiers. How could he do that from the safety of a ship offshore and away from the battle that was raging? Bob Evans went on to bring many soldiers to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. After forcing the German army to retreat from that part of France, the U.S. forces established a secure area of many miles along the beach. In order for Bob to be able to visit the soldiers along the beach to pray with and encourage them, one of his fellow soldiers procured, not through normal channels, a motorcycle for him to use to get to the other soldiers miles away. One day, while riding to visit soldiers in a remote area some distance down the beach, Bob rode his motorcycle right over the top of an anti-tape mine. The explosion threw him in the air with incredible force, with blinding light and intense heat. And being in a remote area of the combat zone all alone, 
there was little chance that he would survive. His injuries were severe. Meanwhile, back at base, his fellow soldiers, who were converted by his testimony of Jesus Christ, seeing he had not returned from his trip to see the other soldiers, confiscated the jeep, again, without permission, and went in search of their chaplain. He was found badly wounded and barely alive. His clothing melted to his skin from the intense heat of the blast from that anti-tank mine. Long story short, Bob was sent to an army hospital in a, in a village in France. This village had been decimated by the German army who were ultimately pushed out by the advancing US forces. Over time, Bob recovered from his life-threatening injuries and while recovering, he spent countless days and hours in the village, ministering to the village folk there, bringing a spiritual revival and great healing to a community that had seen the ugliness of the war firsthand. Those in this village thought there was no chance of life returning to normal, and they were correct. Life did not return to normal, it became better. Due to one man's commitment to Jesus, a restoration that only God can bring was what they experienced. I have to share one other part of the story which illustrates today's message. While Bob was recovering in the hospital, the first soldier that he brought to Jesus came in with severe life-threatening injuries from a grenade explosion. This soldier asked if his friend and chaplain Bob was at that hospital. When Bob found out his friend was there, he went to see him. This soldier, being on his deathbed, asked Bob to send a letter that he had written to his family back home in case he died. In this letter was his testimony to his family of his acceptance and desire to follow Jesus Christ as his person slavery. This soldier died soon after making the request to have his letter sent home. After the war, Bob Evans teamed up with Youth for Christ Ministries and went back to Europe to continue sharing the gospel, growing young and old to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Revelation 10, 14, 15 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. Bob Evans' life story exemplifies what can be done when someone's willing to allow the Holy Spirit to work through them. If you're interested in reading the rest of his story, it was found in the book called Worth the Risk. The story of Ronnie Sinclair I was brought to KMMS Orphanage School in 1996 in grade three from a very poor and broken family of Bangladesh in order to gain a better life with regular food to eat and an education. My world was turned upside down in the best way when I became one of the hundreds of children sponsored by DHCS, which is called Bank of Hope. I had been living with my uncle who didn't have proper meals not even the most basic amenities. We were very poor. There were five children, including me, and it became very difficult for my uncle to send me to school and their trust. Then Bangla Hope came into my life. I started going to school in Bangladesh because of Bangla Hope. I could learn new things, see the world, and meet new people in a new environment at the orphanage. I never experienced the love and affection of a family until I was at Bangla Hope. I could not see any hope in my life before I arrived at Bangla Hope. Now I understood it happened and it was only possible by the help of God through the Bangla Hope organization. I had a terrible accident in my childhood and I am blind in one eye, but I give thanks to God for being with me. I had finished my high school and college um, through the um, BBA Department of Basic and have achieved a government degree. This is only possible with my sponsor's help. I am thankful to Bangladesh, Bangla Hope Organization and my sponsor who constantly extend their helping hand towards me. 
Now I am serving North Union Mission of Seventh Adventist Church. Now I can see uncountable blessings and grace as my life blooms. In 1985, David and Beverly Wade started sponsoring children in Bangladesh, sponsoring their education. Then in, uh, that was 1985. Then in 1995, upon visiting Bangladesh, they decided there needed to be more done to provide a safe home and Christian education for the most vulnerable children in this country. They established a children's home, children's home, which currently has 170 children, birth through high school. Some of these children are orphans with no parents or family to care for them. Some are children that are given up for their, by their parents due to a lack of housing and food and the basic ability to even give them minimal care needed to allow their children to survive. There are numerous heart-wrenching stories about mothers coming to the home and giving their children up to be cared for because they cannot do it. They give their children up knowing their little one would have a better chance of life, a more abundant life, in the care of Bangalore Children's Home. One of the earliest children that came to the home was called Tisha. Her mother, out of desperation, decided to bury her newborn child in the ground. This is called infanticide, which is actually quite, um, quite common in the country of Bangladesh due to the poverty that they endured. A passerby saw what was being done and brought the baby Tisha to the children's home to become, to be cared for. As Tisha grew up, listening and learning the love of Jesus, she gave her heart to him and is now wholly devoted to Jesus Christ. And shares her story with others. She is currently attending medical school. Bangladesh is primarily, primarily a Muslim country with a small minority Hindu population. There are strict laws against preaching Christianity there. However, the government allows a Bible curriculum to be taught to the children in the schools that Bangalore operates. Amen. God is opening doors where it appears they cannot be opened. Currently, besides the main children's home, they own and operate 11 remote schools where a Bible-based curriculum is taught to the children through the fifth grade. One meal is also provided and this meal is the only meal of any substance most of the children receive each day. These are the poorest of the poor in the most remote, remote areas of Bangladesh. This ministry, like many others, started by a desire to reach the unreached, to care for the uncared for, to show the love of Jesus to those who are oppressed and, bur and burdened by every aspect of their life. These stories are not about lifting up individuals, they are about what God can do when we choose to follow Jesus and follow his leading. Why is sharing these stories important? Well, for me, I tend to get caught up in life. What I need to do, what I want, I do this, I do that. Schedules to keep, money to make. Not only does it make me stop and take a closer look at my life, it also makes me take a closer look at what does Jesus require of me. Is there more I can do to share the good news that Jesus is the Savior of this world? Not only has he given me forgiveness of my transgressions, he wants to give me the joy of sharing his truths and the salvation he has for, for each and every one of his creation. If hearing of these stories does not humble us, I don't know what will. Matthew 28, 16 to 20, which is read as our scripture today, is known as the Great Commission. And it says, again, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubted. Some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This passage is familiar to many here today, and I thought it would be a very common message that most Christians would be familiar with. These passages define our, our role in sharing the gospel message 
and making disciples of Jesus Christ. It is very important for us to understand. In a 2018 survey by the Barnett Institute, they asked church members in the U.S. whether they knew what the Great Commission is and re as referred to in the Bible. In Matthew 28, 18-20, it is the most well-known biblical record what is commonly re referred to in extra to extra biblically as the Great Commission. But despite the significance of these and other verses that call Christians to go and make disciples of all nations, a surprising proportion of church shore Christians in the U.S. are generally unaware of these famous words of Jesus. When asked if they have previously heard of the Great Commission, half of the U.S. church shores say they do not know this term at all. It would be reassuring to assume that the other half who knew the term are also actually familiar with the passage known by this name. But that proportion is low. Only 17% actually know about the passage. Meanwhile, the Great Commission does ring a bell for one in four, 25%, though they can't remember what it is. 6% of church goers are simply not sure whether they have heard this term, the Great Commission. Age also makes a significant difference whether church goers recognize the Great Commission. More than one quarter of, of elders and one quarter of boomers say they know the text compared to 17% of Gen X and one in 10 millennials. So as time goes on, fewer and fewer people are, are, are aware of what the Great Commission is in the Bible. Is there any wonder why we are struggling to get the gospel message to all the world? At the time Jesus made this statement, teaching all nations, Matthew 28, 19, there was not the number of countries as there are now in the world. Actually, nations was more a reference to people groups, not actual whole countries. For evangelization purposes, a people group is the largest group within which the gospel can be spread as a church planting movement without encountering barriers of understanding or acceptance. There can be many different people groups within a single country. In fact, there are approximately 17,400 people groups in the world. Of that, 7,400 are considered unreached groups who have little to no Christian followers or evidence of Jesus at all. That equals about 3.1 billion people still to hear the message, most of whom are located in South Asia and North Africa in what is called, which we've heard before, the 1040 window. India has the most unreached groups, 2,445. Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, Nepal, Indonesia, are some of the countries having the largest numbers of unreached. The one thing these countries have in common is the governments are very anti-Christianity. It is very difficult for missionaries to get a foothold in these regions, and persecution of Christians is very high. This can sound a little overwhelming when we read verses like Matthew 24, 14, which says, And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So, overwhelming to you. How exactly will God work through his people to spread the gospel message? I don't know exactly how he'll do it, but it is clear he is calling his people to be part of spreading the end time message prior to Jesus' return to this earth. When the Holy Spirit is poured out in full measure, we will see the fulfillment of these verses in ways I believe we could not have imagined. So we should not become discouraged in what is left to accomplish here on this earth. If we open our hearts to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will be led in the way to go. Acts 2.17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall pacify, prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I'm sure many of you have heard about the accounts uh, that are going on throughout the Muslim community of people hearing dreams and, and visions. And uh, it seems to me like that is going to be a real crucial way that God uses to spread the message. Because as people within their country understand who Jesus is, they are much 
it would be much easier for them to share the gospel to their friends, family, and, and members of their country than it is for somebody like me, a white person, to go into the middle of a Muslim country and expect <coughs> to see great results. So again, we can, we can um, see how the Holy Spirit will work, and he will use his people. It just may not be exactly how we think it, it's going to be done. In Matthew 28, 19, 20, through 19, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, is very specific. It says, Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, or people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Again, God will be with us no matter what part we play in spreading the gospel, whether it's locally, whether it's globally, in our families, He will be with us and give us what we need. These are the final recorded words of Jesus prior to His ascension into heaven. His final words, as it were, for humanity. When we hear about someone giving their final words, usually at the time of their impending death, we listen carefully because they usually have great meaning to those whom their words are meant for. The final recorded words of Jesus are His instructions to His believers here on this earth. Their instructions to us. They should have great meaning to those of us who believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he rose on the third day as prophesied by Jesus himself. Jesus calls us to go, to get up, to mobilize, to engage, to share what we know. Each one of us has our own way of going. Some may be called to be missionaries in a far off land. Some may be called to be pastors, mechanics, construction workers, teachers, janitors, doctors, nurses. There may be some who are struggling with where they fit in. There are those who are retired, and some of us are tired. Some are young, and some are still in school. I do not want to leave anyone out. Again, it does not matter where you are in life, what job you hold. No position in the church is better than another. No person is to be held higher than anyone else. We are all equal in the sight of God. What is important is that we use our talents and abilities to share Jesus with those who we come in contact with each day and to look at the bigger picture of how we can be part of spreading the gospel message to all the world. To the young people in our congregation today, you also have an important role in sharing Jesus to those around you. The way you treat your friends and how you treat your classmates, siblings, and parents says a lot about your character and your relationship with Jesus Christ. I have noticed many times the love of Jesus being shared by the young people in this church. As you continue on your life journey, be open to what God has in store for your life. He may be calling you to be a missionary in a far off land when you're older, but for now he's calling you to be a missionary right where you are. John 13, 14 to 15 says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. We should do as Jesus did. It is evident then that if the master served, we should serve. If he taught, we should teach. If he prayed, we should also pray. He knew that if we put our trust in him, our hearts and our souls would be so full of what of that which we are, had received, we could not be content unless we were sharing, serving, teaching, and praying. You may have heard the story recently of the 21-year-old man named Linser Lopez, who died while trying to rescue a drowning swimmer. Heading out into the water to help the struggling swimmer, he went under the water but did not resurface. A bystander who ultimately rescued the girl, was told that Lance had not, Lance Linser had not resurfaced, jumping into the water and diving deep down into the, into the lake to locate Linser, where he was last seen. He was able to grab hold of his lifeless body. Linser Lopez was at the lake that afternoon with his church group. He had been baptized just minutes earlier to this fateful event. The girl he tried to save was a member of his church. I believe Linser fulfilled the great mission that day. He gave his life so someone else can live. He got up, 
He shared his faith in Jesus by giving his life for another. The testimony of his selfless sacrifice will be forever remembered by those who hear this story. It was reported he was excited about being baptized and that he could not sleep the night before. His testimony of Jesus was given that day through his act of selfless love to another. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than that he lay down his life for his friends. Following Jesus does not mean that we will all be giving up our lives as Linster did. But I would submit, it does mean we must be willing to do so. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I am not up here today to dictate to each of you how you should live your lives. I will leave that to the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. However, we live, however we live our lives, we are accountable to God for the way in which we journey through this life that has been given to us. The way we treat those around us, our family, our neighbors, our church family, our local community, and those who are outside of our direct sphere of influence is a direct result of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My goal today is that we take a closer look at our influence on others and how we can be an active participant in spreading the last day message so that we can all go to our coming home with our Lord and Savior. May I share some changes I would like to make in my life only by the grace of God. First, I want to commit to share more with my immediate family. I want to commit to being a stronger spiritual leader in my home for my wife, Karen. I desire to see my children and grandchildren in heaven with me. I know I have a role to play in sharing Jesus with them and want to commit to being a more active influence in their life. This church family is very special to me. I commit to doing all I can to support those who call the Bible life their place of worship. From meeting personal needs to supporting the mission and goals of this group, Abundant Life Church has a role to play in hastening the coming of Jesus. For my local community, I commit to asking the Holy Spirit to guide me in every interaction I have on a daily basis. Whether that is giving a smile to the clerk and asking how they are doing, or giving a listening ear to an elderly man in Home Depot and praying over him in the middle of the electrical aisle. When that person cuts me off in traffic, or when I see the homeless person on the street corner, and I be Christ-like in my response to them. I know there is much more that I can do if I would just listen to that still, small voice. My, dire, my desire is to rely fully on Jesus for His direction, protection, His mercies, and His grace. The Adventist World Church. I will be praying for ways to support our world church in spreading the unique truths we as a church have been given. There are many outreach organizations that are equipped to do the work within the countries that need the gospel preached so desperately. Through prayer, financial support, and a willingness to go, called, my desire is to meet whatever need is placed on my heart. In 2 Peter 3, uh, 12, it says, what manner, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. In the Acts of the Apostles, page 600 to 601, I'd like to read, Christ has given to the church a sacred charge. Every member should be a channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of His grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that the Savior desires so much as agents who will represent the world, His spirit, and His character represent to the world his spirit and his character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as a manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth, empowering, empowered by him to do a special work, and if she is loyal to him, obedient to all his commandments, there will dwell within her the Excellency of divine grace, if she will be true to her allegiances. She will honor the Lord God of his 
If she will honor the Lord God of Israel, there is no power that can stand against her. Amen. Zeal for God and his cause moved the disciples to bear witness to the gospel with mighty power. Should not a like zeal fire our hearts with a determination to tell the story of the redeeming love of Christ and him crucified? Is it, the privilege? it is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Savior. If the church will put on a robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing, withdrawing from allegiances with, word, with the world, there is before her a dawn of bright and glorious day. God's promise to her will stand fast forever. He will make her an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Truth pass, passing by those who despise and reject it will triumph, although at times apparently retarded, its progress has never been checked. When the message of God meets with the opposition, he gives it additional force that it may exert great influence. Endowed with great energy, it will cut its way through the strongest barriers and triumph over every obstacle. Amen. What sustained the Son of God during his life of toil and sacrifice? He saw the result of, of the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Looking into eternity, he beheld the happiness of those who through his humiliation had received pardon and everlasting life. His ear caught the shout of the redeemed. He heard the ransomed ones singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. How committed are we as Christians in these last days to doing what is asked of us as individuals and as a church to hasten the coming of the Lord? Do we believe Jesus is coming back soon? Amen. Will we have the strength to endure to the end? In closing, I'd like to read Isaiah 40, 28 to 30. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. My friends, I believe we are in the last hours of earth's history. Jesus is coming soon to take us home. My question for us today is, what can we do? No, what will we do? in order to teach all nations about Jesus and Him crucified.